Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on what's going to be in the 2022 exams. This video is for the AQA specification and it's for separate biology, sometimes called triple science in some schools. This content is for biology paper two and it's for higher tier students. So first of all, let's go through the topics that they've told you won't be assessed in this paper and there's a lot of them, it actually goes onto two slides here. So it's structure and function, the brain, the eye, hormones in human reproduction, contraception, the use of hormones to treat infertility, negative feedback, use of plant hormones, advantages and disadvantages of sexual and asexual reproduction, sex determination, variation and evolution, the development of understanding of genetics and evolution, classification of living organisms, adaptations, impact of environmental change, biodiversity, deforestation, maintaining biodiversity, trophic levels, pyramids of biomass, sustainable fisheries and role of biotechnology. They have told you the required practicals to focus on for this exam and these are plant growth and organism distribution. Do have a look in the description because I'll put a link there to a video just focusing on these two required practicals for you. But they've also told us the topics in the exam which will be a major focus and these are the nervous system, hormonal control in humans, plant hormones, reproduction and organisation of an ecosystem. So the rest of this video focuses on the content for these major foci and it will also remove anything that they've told you won't be assessed on the paper. Do also have a look out in the description because as well as the required practical link I'll hopefully put a link there for some practice questions just on these topics of major focus for you. We said before that homeostasis was maintaining a constant internal environment and as part of homeostasis we need to control our body temperature and as humans we control our body temperature at 37 degrees C. This is because this temperature is the optimum temperature for enzymes to work. Too hot above 37 or too cool below 37 our enzymes will not function properly and that will slow all of the chemical reactions in our body. So our body has automatic systems to maintain our temperature very close to that region of 37 degrees C. Our body temperature is controlled by the brain. We don't need to know whereabouts in the brain but approximately here we've got a thermoregulatory centre. And this coordinates the response to any um, temperature changes in the, in the body. So we can call out the coordinator. Within this thermoregulatory centre, it has um, receptors which detect changes to our blood temperature. And also, as you probably know, our skin also contains receptor cells that detect changes to the temperature of the environment. So both of these things um, help to regulate our internal body temperature. So just recapping to the nerve pathway that might be involved in this process, if these receptor cells on our arm detect a decrease in temperature, they would send a signal to the sensory neuron and then to the CNS, the brain and the spinal cord, and this would involve the thermoregulatory centre here. 
then that signal would be sent along a motor neuron to an effector and that effector may well be a muscle or a gland so this effector here could be a signal given uh, to a muscle or a gland for example a muscle um, could help your hairs stand up on your arm or a gland could perhaps be used in uh, the release of sweat. So if your body temperature becomes too low, there are several mechanisms that your body can put into place to counteract this. First of all, you would stop sweating. You might shiver. Your hairs might stand up. For example on your arms and on your legs and what this is doing is it if your hairs are flat it doesn't provide any insulation but if your hairs then stand up it um, traps a layer of air which then provides insulation so that helps then to warm up your body a little bit more so traps air for insulation and the final thing that might happen is a process called vasoconstriction and in vasoconstriction your blood vessels constrict and reduce the blood supply to the skin So what it's doing there is really conserving um, all your major internal organs and reducing the blood supply to the outside of your body. So the blood vessels will constrict slightly, reducing the blood flow, um, and then that often causes perhaps the outer parts of your body to go a bit paler. On the other side, if your temperature is too high, as part of your nerve response, an effector might be a gland which causes your body to sweat more and through the evaporation of the sweat that will provide a cooling effect and will allow your temperature to return towards normal. As well as that, um, you will have your hairs lie flat and you will also have vasodilation which is the opposite of vasoconstriction where your blood vessels get slightly wider they dilate and by doing that they provide more blood to the skin and therefore the heat can then radiate out of your body and in that case you'll find your um, you can feel your hands getting a little bit more swollen. You might have um, felt that if you're ever in a, in a hot climate. You can feel your hands and your feet getting more swollen as more blood is directed to the skin and therefore heat can be lost via radiation out of the skin. The endocrine system. It's a really difficult word just to describe glands that produce hormones. Control in our body by hormones is slower than that of nerves, than a nerve response. It acts in a more general way. And usually the response lasts longer. Now there are several um, endocrine glands that you need to be aware of. The most important one here in your head is called the pituitary gland. And that has got a little bit of a nickname called the master gland because that is often responsible for switching on and off other endocrine glands in your body. The one in your throat here is called the thyroid gland that produces a hormone called 
thyroxine. Pituitary gland produces lots of hormones that we'll talk about later as well. The adrenal glands here, they produce adrenaline. You've got the pancreas here, a really important gland that um, produces lots of different hormones. And we'll talk about the pancreas later on too. And depending on whether you're male or female, females have ovaries. And we'll talk about those when we talk about the menstrual cycle. And the men have testes. And the hormone that's produced there is testosterone. We're going to look now at the pancreas in a little bit more detail because we're going to talk about one of the things that's important in homeostasis which is controlling the blood sugar levels. So the pancreas is involved in controlling blood sugar levels because it produces a hormone called insulin. It's something that your bodies will produce all of the time and what the insulin does is if there's too much glucose in your blood I'll just represent the glucose by a G if there's too much glucose in your blood the pancreas will start producing more insulin and that will cause the glucose to go into your muscle and your liver cells and here it can be stored as glycogen so the liver itself stores glucose as glycogen so difficult words here glucose and glycogen sound very similar but if the blood glucose levels are too high it is controlled by this hormone insulin this um, next bit is for um, higher tier only, just this slide here, because you also need to know what happens when the blood glucose levels get too low. The pancreas produces another hormone, this time called glucagon. Again, annoyingly very similar to the words glycogon and glu uh, glucose that we looked at earlier. So glucagon is a hormone produced in the pancreas, and what that will do is it will cause the liver to turn that glycogen into glucose again which will then go back into our blood so it does the opposite of the process that insulin does that we talked about before so higher tier only need to know about glucagon if the blood glucose levels are too low glucagon helps convert glycogen into glucose which is put back into the blood. This is an example of a negative feedback cycle so if your blood sugar levels get high and then low and then high again your um, main um, goal is to keep them at as close to their optimum level as you can. So if the glucose levels get too high your body will produce insulin and make them go low again. If the glucose levels get too low, your body will produce glucagon and therefore increase the blood glucose levels again. And it kind of wavers around this optimum midpoint. And the trouble with controlling blood glucose is it is linked to a, um, a disorder called diabetes. There are two types. Type 1 diabetes is the type that is inherited. And in this, this type of diabetes, your body produces little or no insulin. And this is the um, type of diabetes that the doctor will um, prescribe insulin therapy. So that involves insulin injections. And you have to keep a close monitor of the glucose intake that you're taking into your body. If your blood glucose gets really low, you will quickly eat some biscuits or some um, foods that are high in glucose. And um, you also need to um, regularly remember to go and get your insulin injections. 
Type 2 diabetes, however, is caused by lifestyle factors. It's often linked to um, diet and obesity, and you get that later on in life. And it's when you still produce insulin, but your body um, is resistant to your own insulin. So basically it becomes no longer, it no longer is effective. So you're still producing it, but it's not working anymore. It's not reducing your blood sugars to normal. So your doctor will prescribe in this case um, a carbohydrate controlled diet. Because remembering back from um, topics on diet, the carbohydrates in paper one um, convert into can be broken down into sugars like glucose. So we need to control the amount of carbohydrates we're taking into our diet, and also he will he or she will suggest an exercise routine as well to help maintain your weight, which is obviously a risk factor in terms of diabetes. The kidneys are organs that play an important role in maintaining the water and ion balance within the body and also removing a substance called urea which is produced by the body and together a balance of water, ions, urea and other substances is called urine which is produced by the kidneys and removed from the body. Why it's important to make maintain this water and ion balance is so that the correct osmotic balance is maintained within the body. We know from a previous topic that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from where there is a high concentration of water molecules to a lower concentration of water molecules. Or you may well have learnt it from a dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. I'm also going to put some ions in here as well because they're important too. So in our body we have a mixture of water and ions and these can move in and out of cells. Water of course moves by osmosis and ions might move by active transport or diffusion. The cells in our body maintain a particular shape and they need a certain amount of water in there to do their functions. If the osmotic balance changed outside of the cells you may either see water moving out of the cells which will cause a problem. If there is a net movement out it will cause the cells to not have enough water, they may shrivel a little bit and they won't be able to perform their functions properly. Alternatively the osmotic balance could shift so that water moved into the cells causing too much water to move in um, perhaps could cause the cell to rupture um, and it would not be able to um, perform its function so maintaining this osmotic balance within our bodies is really really important there are a number of ways in which we um, remove water from the body so water can be removed naturally and we don't have control over this but through the lungs and through sweating and we have no control over how much is lost by those means. Ions um, are things that you can take into your body through your um, uh, through digestion so they're things like sodium ions, magnesium ions and things like that and they too are lost through sweat and finally urea is a substance that is produced by the body and this can also be lost through sweat as well however where these um, mechanisms aren't properly controlling the amount of water ions and urea that we need in our body that's where the kidneys come in because they can um, control the amount of water that is lost through our uh, kidneys helping maintain the water balance. This has control over the ions that are lost through urine and also it can help remove any excess urea. So whereas these 
functions we don't have control of, our kidneys um, do control the amount of water, ions and urea that is lost through urine. So there's two processes as to how the kidneys work. The first one is filtration and this does what it says on the tin, it filters the blood. So as the blood travels through the kidneys it is filtered and things such as um, ions, urea, glucose, etc. are removed. However, you may not be in a position where you want all of those ions, urea, glucose, water, etc. removed and you may want to put some back into the blood and that's where step two comes in. After filtration there's a process called selective reabsorption whereby some of these things if necessary are put back into the blood in the correct amounts that's why there is called selective reabsorption so some substances are put back into the blood. As we said before, to maintain the osmotic balance you wouldn't want to remove all of the water or all of the ions for example, but you'd want to remove a certain amount so that the osmotic balance is maintained and then the rest you'd want to put back into the blood. And the result of that would be that you produce urine which would contain water, glucose, ions, urea, etc. Just in addition to that, we said that the kidneys are involved, involved in the removal of urea and you need to know a little bit about where that comes from. When you digest protein, your body breaks that protein down into amino acids which are used for growth and repair. However, excess amino acids not used by the body need to be removed. And to help remove them in the liver, there's a process called deamination, which you don't need to know in a lot of detail. You'll just need to perhaps recall the name. But what that does is it breaks down the amino acid and produces ammonia. However, there's a problem with that. Ammonia itself, being in the body, is toxic. Therefore, straight away, it's converted into urea. And then that can be removed by the kidneys. For patients suffering with kidney failure, one option is for them to regularly use a dialysis machine. So this could mean them visiting the hospital three to four um, times a week and they would be attached to a machine for several hours. How the machine works is very similar to how a kidney works in that blood is taken out of a person and fed into a machine. The blood is fed through an air of the machine which has a partially permeable membrane and then the blood returns back into the person. At this point here where you've got a partially permeable membrane that means it is selective to the molecules that can go out of the blood into another part of the machine. And at this point here surrounding the partially permeable membrane is dialysis fluid. This fluid has very similar properties to blood and it has the ideal concentrations of water and ions in the blood. So what happens as the blood flows through the machine out of the person it will enter this 
partially permeable region and at this point substances such as urea, excess ions and water will leave the machine and much larger molecules like proteins will stay in the blood just like it would in the kidney. So this allows the blood to be cleaned even when the patient has um, a failing kidney. But this has to be done quite regularly so every sort of three, three to four times a week they might have to go to hospital for several hours which will obviously affect their ability to work and lead a normal life. Um, they're attached to the machine, the, their blood is cleaned and filtered and put back into their systems but it is, it's quite um, a long process, it's not a cure it won't cure the kidney disease, it will only help to clean the blood and give them a better quality of life whilst they wait for an organ donor. So that's the other option that they can do, either um, put themselves on a, or the doctor put them on a waiting list for an organ donor, either that can come from someone who has died and is on the organ donor register, so is, is opted at their point of death to offer any of their organs to be used for other people or it could be a living donor. With this though obviously there is a, um, a slight risk to the donor because they have to undergo a procedure to have their kidney removed and you can live with one kidney but you just need to live more of a careful lifestyle and, and think about the things that, that you are eating and the, and the lifestyle that you are living. Um, there are long waiting lists for both of them, and but in the long term, it is cheaper to um, go through an operation and provide someone with a, a donated kidney rather than spending a lot of money regularly for them to um, be attached to the dialysis machine to clean their kidneys, to clean their blood, sorry. As part of the higher tier only content for separate science, you need to know how hormones are involved in controlling water levels. Well, the master gland, the pituitary gland, is again involved in this process. The pituitary gland produces a hormone called ADH. And this hormone helps regulate the permeability of the kidney tubules, which is a part of the kidney. And by permeability, we mean how much water can leave the kidney and go back into the blood. So if the body were to detect that the blood was too concentrated, in other words, not enough water was in the blood, it would want the kidneys to release more water back into the blood. So to do that, what it would do was the pituitary gland would release ADH into the bloodstream. That would then cause the kidneys to release more water into the bloodstream because it would increase the permeability of the kidney tubules and more water would be released or reabsorbed into the bloodstream and that helps the body then maintain the balance of water within the blood and this is again a negative feedback system whereby if the levels of water in the blood go either above or below normal, the negative feedback system will ensure that the um, water levels in the blood are returned to normal. For example, if there was too much water in the blood, at this point here the ADH would be inhibited. That will help it bring back to normal, but if there's not enough water in the blood, at this point here, ADH would be stimulated to help bring the levels back to normal.
The first plant hormone we're going to talk about is auxin, and auxin is involved in the growth of the plant. It has different effects whether you're talking about auxins in the root or auxins in the shoot of the plant. So the shoot of the plant is the bit that grows um, upwards out of the seed. If we have this as a seed, shoot would grow upwards and um, come out of the ground and the roots would stay below the ground. Auxin in both is produced in the tips of the root and the shoot. However, in the, in the shoot, the presence of the auxins stimulates growth. So where there is more auxins, there is more growth. However, in the root, the auxins inhibit, which means stop growth or slow growth. So in the root, where there are more auxins, there is going to be less growth. This helps us then explain a concept called phototropism, whereby plants respond to light. And auxins are responsible for how plants can bend towards the light. So for example, if I draw a very um, basic shoot, and if I put over here the light source, we know that that shoot will bend towards the light so it can get the maximum light intensity possible for photosynthesis. But you need to be able to explain exactly how it does that. So we said before that the auxins are produced in the tip of the plant, these are hormones. And what happens in response to light is the auxins move to the shady side. As we said before, auxin stimulates growth in the shoot, so now we will get unequal growth rates and we will get the plant on the left hand side here, in the shady side, growing more than the other side, which then will cause the shoot to bend over towards the light. So the main points that we need to put are the auxin collects on the shady side, that auxin stimulates growth and that there are unequal growth rates which means on the left and right hand side they grow at different rates that results in the plant or the shoot bending towards the light A second concept that you need to be aware of is gravitropism, otherwise known as geotropism. You can use either word in the exam. And this is the, the plant responding to gravity. And for this example, I'm going to draw a seed on its side with a shoot and a root. So I'll just put here so we um, remember them, shoot and as we said before the auxins are produced in the tip of the shoot and the tip of the root but because it's laid on its side the auxins collect on the lower side and they have different effects whether we're talking about the shoot or the root. As we said before in the root, in the shoot sorry growth is stimulated, therefore there will be unequal growth rates, the lower side of the leaf, the cells will grow and elongate more and you'll get more growth on this side compared to this side and therefore you will get the shoot moving upwards. So again the same kind of things, the idea that it stimulates the growth in the shoot, you must include the, the phrase unequal growth rates due to the fact that there is unequal distribution of auxin. And that leads to the lower side growing more than the upper side and the shoot grows outwards. 
However, despite the auxin collecting in the similar place on the root, if you remember from before, in the root the auxin inhibits growth. So this time there will be less growth on the lower side and more growth on the upper side. So you'll find that the root grows more on the upper side, less on the lower side, and therefore you get it growing downwards into the soil. And that's exactly what you want. When you have a seed laying on its side, you want the shoot to respond to gravity and move upwards. And likewise, with the root, you want that to be going downwards. We are now going to discuss a required practical, which is for separate scientists only. It's quite a simple required practical. Um, it wants you to investigate the effect of light or gravity on growth of plants. Um, and one suggestion might be, for example, that you have a petri dish or maybe three petri dishes and you make sure the conditions are same in all of them so the same water level same type of seed the number of seeds etc so on these petri dish you normally put a piece of um, cotton wool at the bottom that's enough to grow um, crest seeds damp cotton wool but you might talk about soil at the bottom or something like that you then place on top of that for example, 10 crest seeds, I'm just going to do five, equally spaced out. And you would change a condition, light or gravity, that, that one's quite difficult, I'll come on to this one in a minute. But you might can change the light conditions. So you might, for example, for this one, have the light source going straight down on the plant. For this one, you might have the light source at an angle, like so. Or... You may well have changed the light intensity, maybe change the power of the light bulb that you're using um, to see the effects that that has on the growth of plants. The important thing that they might talk to you about is control variables, because it's important that you keep a number of things the same. So like we discussed, the type of the seed that you're using, the number of seeds that you're using the spacing of the seeds, otherwise competition might become a factor. Things like your water, your temperature. You shouldn't just put water actually, you should put volume of water. Um, and all those things that they might keep the same. So just bear in mind um, those control variables are important to show that growth um, is determined by the light, the effect of light and not any of these other factors. Then you would leave the seeds to grow. And in this example, you would have uh, the seeds here growing straight upwards. These ones would respond to the light. And you need to be able to do a number of things. You need to be able to draw detailed drawings of your results. And you will also need to measure the length of your shoots. Okay, so nice easy experiment, setting up seeds, controlling the conditions and changing either light or gravity. So to show the effect of gravity um, instead of light, if, if you wanted to do that, or they might bring that up in the exam, you could perhaps have one pot with your seeds on facing upwards. You could have one pot with your seeds on facing one direction and then the other and then you would observe the growth of the plants. Obviously with this one we'd expect them to grow upwards and with these ones we expect them to have a little bend and then grow upwards as well. And again, you'd need to make detailed drawings of these, measure the length and control um, all the suitable conditions. For example, the light intensity, um, the direction of the light, 
the uh, type of seed that you're using, the number of seeds, etc., to show that these uh, this growth is due to the effect of gravity and not anything else. First of all, then talking about DNA and genes, you need to know that DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. It looks a little bit like this in that it is a polymer, which means a long molecule. It is a DNA double helix, um, and it is found in the nucleus of your cells. Often in the nucleus, if we just take a picture of what the nucleus looks like, often in the nucleus it is um, just loose DNA because it's being used. It's using uh, it's being used to make proteins, but sometimes it can be organised in there in chromosomes. And you might see chromosomes like that. Also, you may also see chromosomes that look a bit more like a cross when they have doubled up and got exact copies of each other. So be aware that you might see both of those in the exam. Anyway, in the cell you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 46 in total. In pairs, chromosomes, sorry, they're in pairs because they you have one from your mother and one from your father. So you have 46 chromosomes in total. A length of a particular uh, sequence of DNA is called a gene. And that gene is used to make amino acids, of which there are about 20 or so of them. And a particular sequence of amino acids is used to make proteins. Your entire genome, the entire genetic information, sorry, in your in an organism, whether it's a plant or an animal, is called a genome. And that's really important to help us um, investigate inherited disorders or the things like human evolution and how we're all related to each other and how we've migrated in the past. For separate science, you need to know a little bit more detail about the structure of DNA and protein synthesis. First of all, you need to know that the um, DNA polymer is made out of complementary base pairs, whereby A complements T and can be matched together, and C and G are complementary base pairs. For example, here you've got C matching up against G, and A matching up against T. You also need to know that the, um, the strand is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. So you might see pictures of it that show a phosphate molecule attached to a sugar. And you need to know that it is the base that attaches to the sugar part and not the phosphate. So this would be the phosphate sugar and the base. This together we call a nucleotide. So you need to describe the DNA as a polymer that can be made up of four different nucleotides. We said before that a particular sequence of DNA can code for a gene which will code for a specific um, sequence of amino acids which will then code for a particular protein. But further to that there is also non-coding DNA, quite a lot of the, the genome is non-coding DNA and amongst other things it is evolve, uh, involved in switching on and off genes. So what proteins can we make from the DNA that is present in, in our cells. Well, we can make hormones, we can make enzymes, and we can make structural proteins, for example, um, something like collagen. But for separate science, you also need to know a little bit more detail about the process that gets you from the um, genetic information that is held within the DNA molecule and to making a very particular protein. 
And the first thing that you need to know is that whilst you've got a long sequence of DNA bases, it is just three bases that codes for a particular amino acid. So when we get to the ribosome in a minute, this sequence is read in threes, and that will code for a particular amino acid, of which we said before there are 20 different amino acids. But the problem is the DNA cannot leave the nucleus. So what happens is inside the nucleus, an mRNA strand is made, which is a template of the DNA. Okay, so this bit happens within the nucleus of the cell. And then this mRNA strand can leave the cell and that can go to the ribosomes and that is where pro protein synthesis happens. It happens at the ribosomes within the cytoplasm. And here at the ribosome, the um, mRNA template is, is read in threes again. And we said that each three bases will code for a particular amino acid. So when the, the three bases is read, a particular carrier molecule will bring that specific amino acid to the chain. You only need to know it as a carrier molecule in your, in your exam, although you may well have researched it as tRNA. But that will bring a very specific amino acid to your chain, and that will peel off and start to make a long chain protein, a long sequence of acids, uh, amino acids, sorry, which will make your protein. So this protein will eventually fold up and have a very particular shape with a very specific active site. And as we said before, this could be a hormone, an enzyme, or perhaps some kind of structural protein. To go from that step of starting off with a very particular sequence of DNA to create a very specific sequence of amino acids and then to create a very specific protein with an active site of a particular shape you need all of the DNA to be correctly um, copied into mRNA and correctly read at the ribosomes however occasionally there are mutations that occur with the DNA so perhaps something like ionizing radiation might cause this base to change and that can cause problems because it can change the shape of the active site which means that the protein will no longer work. Most mutations that occur won't have a significant effect on the protein so it may just change it slightly maybe not even in the active site region perhaps around here a slight change which will not affect the function of the protein. However, occasionally mutations can cause massive trouble. They can cause inherited disorders um, such as cystic fibrosis. There are three different kinds that you need to know about. One of those are insertions. With an insertion, an extra base is added. And the trouble is with this, it has knock-on effects for all of the amino acids and therefore the structure of the protein later on. For example, if you had a particular sequence of bases in your gene, an insertion would mean an extra base is added to that sequence. For example, rather than starting TA, we could say that an extra T has been inserted into the sequence but the reason this causes knock-on effects is because if you remember each three bases um, codes for a particular amino acid so by changing the sequence of codes here you are going to end up coding for a different amino acid 
and this will happen all along the chain. So our first two were TAG, CGA, which would have coded for two particular amino acids, but the insertion has caused us now to read TTA, GCG. So this will affect the amino acids and therefore affect the shape of the protein that's made. The second one is similar, and that is a deletion. So the opposite, this time a base is deleted, but in the same way it can have knock-on effects down the whole uh, chain of bases. This will affect the amino acids and therefore the proteins that are made. So rather than inserting a gene this time, sorry, inserting a base this time, we might have, for example, this A disappear and we'll end up with a sequence TGC GAT. And at that point, again, we've got different sequences of bases, therefore different amino acids are going to be made and the protein is going to be different. The final one is a substitution. And with this one, it only affects one amino acid. It could have a detrimental effect to the whole protein um, if it's in an important place or does an important role in the protein, but it only affects one amino acid. So if we start again with the sequence on the left, this time we're just going to substitute A for another base, so we might end up with something like T C G C G A T. And this time only this amino acid is affected, and you can see the other one is the same as before the mutation. Next we'll talk about reproduction. The first one that we're going to talk about is sexual reproduction, so within plants that involves the sex cells called the gametes, so with an animals and plants that's called uh, the gametes, which are the sex cells. In animals this is the sperm and the egg, and in plants this is pollen and the egg. So in fertilisation, um, in sexual reproduction, sorry, you go through a process called fertilisation. And in this process, if we take the sperm and the egg as the example, the sperm with 23 chromosomes will um, insert itself into an egg, which also has 23 chromosomes, and then together they will make a fertilised egg with 46 chromosomes in, 23 pairs. And then, like it says here, that after fertilisation, that cell will then start to divide and again and again until they make an embryo and then a full organism. And that cell division is mitosis. Next, we're going to talk about meiosis, which is a, a different type of cell division that happens in the ovaries and the testes. Meiosis is the process by which gametes are produced. So it happens in the reproductive organs, ovaries and testes. One way to remember it is meiosis happens in my ovaries and mitosis happens in my toe. So meiosis in, is involved in producing the sex cells, so the egg and the sperm and then mitosis is involved in any sort of growth and repair in the body and cell replication after fertilisation. So what happens in my meiosis is that um, when a cell starts to divide, it will its DNA will be packaged into chromosomes and each chromosome will double up so it has two arms and it will look a little something like this. Then what happens is chromosomes pair 1 to 23 will line up in the middle. I won't have space to draw 23, but you'll get the idea. And a first cell division occurs. In that first cell division, the chromosomes are pulled apart. But at this stage, when they're meeting each other in the middle, there's a bit of crossover of genetic information. So 
the genetic information that was from the mother and the father mix and that causes variation which is important for the end. So there's a little bit of mixing going on there. Then these two chromosomes are pulled apart. So you end up with two cells and a first division um, with 23 chromosomes. They still look like these X shapes at the moment, all the way down to pair 23, and the same on this side. And again, they line up in the middle of the cell. You then get a second cell division, whereby the each arm of the chromosome is pulled apart, and these aren't identical anymore because of the mixing that's happened up there. So they pull apart, and you end up with cells here with 23 chromosomes in it, all the way down to chromosome 23. So I haven't got time to draw 23, but you get the idea. Each of these at the end will be have 23 chromosomes in. Each of them will be different because of the variation at the top, so these will be genetically different. And they will um, be either sperm, if they've been made in the testes, or they will be eggs. So that's how egg cells are produced. The other form of reproduction that you might see um, doesn't involve meiosis and making egg cells at all. It doesn't involve fertilization because it is simply one cell making a clone of itself. That organism, that cell, or the, all those cells and an entire organism can make a clone. This can happen in plants or animals. And with asexual reproduction, the offspring are genetically identical. So within the um, animal kingdom, sexual reproduction is far more common than asexual, but within plants, it's very common to see both types quite often. We are going to um, draw some more genetic diagrams now, but to be able to do that, we need to know a few key terms. The first one is allele. Allele is a form of a gene, or one form of a gene. Try not to say type type of gene you will not get the mark for. Say one form of a gene. So a dominant allele means that a characteristic is always expressed if one allele is dominant. So if you have a dominant allele, a dominant form of a gene in your um, DNA, you will um, express that particular characteristic. Whereas a recessive allele, the characteristic is only expressed if both alleles are, res are recessive. So what that means is to express something that is recessive, you have to have a, um, a recessive allele from both your mother and your father to have the chance of expressing that particular characteristic. A phenotype is what you look like. Um, so it's the characteristic that is expressed. So if they ask you about the phenotype, you might be um, talking about brown hair, for example, or tongue rolling. It's whatever characteristic you're talking about in the question. A genotype is the alleles present at the genetic level. So your genotype, for example, would be, um, if we're looking at tongue rolling, it could be T. T, two capital T's. I forgot to mention up here that when we express alleles as letters, a dominant allele is a capital letter and a recessive allele is a lowercase letter. So here we've got TT, this would be called homozygous dominant. Homo meaning the same, we have two of the same dominant alleles. Lowercase t's would be called homozygous recessive. 
FOMO meaning the same, and two recessive alleles because you've got two lowercase letters. And the final one that you can have is one of each, which is heterozygous. So that's going to be important for us to draw our genetic crosses. We'll start here by this example. If you're doing higher tier, you would have to draw the genetic cross from scratch. If you do foundation tier, you'll probably be given the genetic cross and have to complete it. So this question says the ability to roll your tongue is caused by a dominant allele. What is the probability that a woman who is homozygous recessive for tongue rolling has offspring that can roll their tongues if she has children with a man who is heterozygous? So let's use the letter T again. We said recessive would be lowercase t, lowercase t, because homozygous is recessive. Heterozygous would be t, t. So we'd cross those in a genetic cross, capital T, lowercase t, crossed with TT. You'd have to do that from scratch if you're doing higher tier. Foundation, you would have to complete this cross here. So all you do is match up the letters. Here you would get TT. Here you get two lowercase t's, two lowercase t's, and here TT. So if... Tongue rolling is caused by a dominant allele. Any time you've got a capital letter, you will be a tongue roller. So here, we finish it off by saying you've got a 50% chance of tongue rolling. Now we're going to move on to look at inherited disorders, and two that we'll look at are polydactyly and cystic fibrosis. Polydactyly is a disorder caused by a dominant allele. But this allele is quite rare in the population. So even though it's dominant, not many people possess this allele. But if they do pass it to the next generation, then they will be born with an extra digit on their feet or on their hands. This um, polydactyly is quite easy to deal with. It's dealt with at birth and the extra digit is removed. And lots of people don't even realise that they um, suffered with that disorder from birth. This other disorder is cystic fibrosis. This is caused by a recessive allele. And this affects the cell membranes. With cystic fibrosis, you can see here a sufferer having um, lung difficulties. It causes um, mucus, an excess mucus, to be present in the airways, in the air passages because of this disorder with the cell membranes. And what it causes is really severe um, breathing difficulties and people find it um, difficult to get enough oxygen into their lungs and it can quite severely affect their lives in some cases. So one suggestion to help improve for such in inherited disorders is to do something called embryo screening, which is looking at the embryo, when, which is a ball of cells right at the beginning of life, and selecting a cell from that embryo and looking into its DNA to see if it has genes which could cause um, some of these genetic disorders. And what they are looking into um, is perhaps being able to change or remove a certain gene that they find that's causing a disorder or could cause a disorder, or perhaps even suggesting that they wouldn't use this embryo and they would choose another one that the mother and father had produced instead. Obviously that has a lot of ethical and economical and moral advantages and disadvantages behind it which I suggest you look further into. Um, advan main advantages are that it could eradicate some of these genetic disorders but obviously there's a lot of debate surrounding it because um, you know, you're choosing what embryos survive and live and you're perhaps prejudicing people with these disorders. So there's lots of continuing debate around it. Next, we're going to look at food chains. It's quite a simple concept, but there are lots of important words involved. This is the idea that we can link organisms in a community depending on what organism eats what. For example, in this food chain, we have the grass, which is then eaten by the grasshopper, which is then eaten by the mouse, and which is finally eaten by the owl. 
So a few key words, first of all this grass here and always at the beginning of the food chain you have something called a producer. This is because it produces its own fruit, food by a process called photosynthesis where that process gets its energy from originally is the sun. So energy is transferred to the plants and they use that energy from the sun to make their own food. That is then consumed by the grasshopper. So all of these three organisms here are called consumers, but this one is the primary consumer because it is the first consumer in the chain. The mouse is what we call the secondary consumer because it is the second organism in the food chain and the owl is called the tertiary consumer. Now we don't have a continual line of organisms here. Within a food chain you only tend to have four or five or maybe up to half a dozen organisms. After that it stops. Now the reason for that is because not all of the, the biomass is passed up the food chain. That means not all of the mass of each organism is passed up each food chain. Because for example, um, perhaps the grasshopper can't eat all of the different parts of the plant. Perhaps it's, uh, there's some structures that it can't consume. The mouse, for example, might not eat all of the grasshopper, maybe it leaves out its wings or its legs because it's they find those inedible. Um, and the owl, for example, won't digest all of the mouse. It'll it will swallow all of the mouse, but then it will bring up things like its its fur and any of the hard bones that it can't digest. So by the time it gets to the end of the food chain, there is not enough energy. for another organism. Energy is wasted in other ways as well, for example through the movement of the organisms, through the fact that they produce faeces, and as we said before, the fact that there are inedible, which means they can't be eaten, parts of the organism. So by the time you get to the end, there's just simply not enough energy for another organism to fit into the food chain. That's why the arrows face in this direction. They show the direction of energy transferred. So they always have to be in this direction, moving from the producers through to the consumers. A couple of extra key words then. Um, we would describe the owl as a predator. And we would describe, for example, the mouse as prey. Anything that's eaten is called prey and anything that's doing the eating is called the predator. So in the same way the grasshopper would be the prey for the mouse and the mouse would be the predator of the grasshopper. Next we're going to look at a required practical for paper 2 which is all about how organisms are distributed and this required practical is all about the idea of random sampling of a population. Population being one species, if you remember from the keywords that we looked at before. For example, if you had a very large area, say 100 metres by 100 metres, you might want to estimate the number of a particular organism that is in that area. For example, the one that's often used at school is you might want to um, measure or estimate the number of daisies in a particular field. And you might want to compare two different fields, sunny versus shady, for example, or different fields with different pHs, perhaps different fields with different grass types as well. There's lots of things that you could look at, but the main thing is that you can't sample the whole field. It would be too time consuming and nigh on impossible to go and calculate the number of daisies in that field. What we can do is we can subsample a much smaller area of the field. It's not to scale, but for example, we could have an area that was 10 meters by 10 meters. And what you do is you divide that grid up again 
with string. So there we have it, we have a grid in the middle of our field and we've divided that grid up into 100 squares. So if we were to write a method for this, or start writing a method, we would um, first of all write that we would measure an area 10 by 10 metres and divide this up into a grid with squares of one meter by one meter. Then still within that grid we can't sample all of the different squares within there. So what we need to do is we need to use a random number generator and we need to use that to pick for example 10 or 20 squares that we are going to sample. They'll ask you about this in the exam, perhaps the more squares you sample the more reliable your results are going to be. So we can use a random number generator, so for example if we assigned these squares from top left to bottom right, 1 to 100, so we'd go along and say that was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. We could then use our random number generator and say for example that it picked out 10 squares at random We would then sample within those 10 squares and what would we use is a grid that looks very similar to this called a quadrat. So a quadrat is a metal grid. Sometimes they are 1 meters by 1 meters. it depends on the quadrat you've got. Um, other quadrats are a bit smaller, perhaps 0.5 meters by 0.5 meters or something like that. So you need to be aware of how big a quadrat you're using. I'm going to suggest we're going to use a one meter by one meter quadrat and what we do we would then place that on one of our sampling squares and we would count the number of daisies within that quadrat. So we can build up our method here. We've used a random number generator and now we are going to count the number of daisies in each of the 10 squares by placing a quadrat over the grid square and counting the organisms we find or counting the daisies in this case that we find. And we would repeat that for each of our 10 squares and then we would take an average number of daisies per quadrat and then we would then have an average number of daisies per meters squared. And with that information, you can then compare that to a shady field, repeating it in the same way, measuring an area, dividing it up into a grid, using a random number generator to pick, for example, 10 squares, placing a quadrat on those squares and counting the number of daisies within the quadrat. The second way that you can sample organisms is, is by using a transect. This is um, slightly different, although it does use those metal grids that we used before called quadrats. It doesn't have to use quadrats, but it can do. Um, for example, what you might want to do is look at the distribution of organisms in a straight line away from a tree. And what you would do was you'd lay down your measuring tape, which is your transect line, and you would lay that down on the ground away from the tree. Then at regular intervals, for example every meter or every two meters, you would sample the organisms. 
And to do that, you could either just count the number of organisms that were touching your um, tape measure or your piece of string that you put down as your transit, li transit line, um, or you could place your quadrat there and count the number of organisms that you find within your quadrat. Not only could you do that in a horizontal way, you can also um, do transects vertically, for example, up a tree. You could lay a piece of string or a measuring tape up a tree and sample something like leaf size or lichen cover as you go up the tree. So you might not want to use a quadrat um, or you might just want to have a look at regular intervals Next to that um, string line or tape measure, you might want to measure the size of the lichen that you find. In the same way that you can do that on a wall, for example, here you could lay a transect vertically on the wall and next to the transect at regular intervals, you could either place a small quadrat or you could simply um, measure the size of the lichen at that point. With a quadrat, not only might you want to count the number of organisms, but for some organisms this is particularly difficult. Um, and instead, you might want to calculate the percentage cover in the quadrat instead. And you may well be asked to do that in the exam. So, for example, if I draw a very, very small, simple quadrat that is 5 squares by 5 squares, in total, there are 25 squares. And let's say, for example, that we put this on the wall and we had a particular coverage of lichen, like so. We would count the squares that are covered with lichen. In this case, there are one, two, three, four five squares that are covered in lichen and we would use that to calculate the percentage cover so you do the number of squares with the organism in it divided by the total number of squares and then multiply by 100 to get your percentage so in this case we've got 5 divided by 25 multiplied by 100 and that will give us our percentage cover of 20%. We're now going to look at the water cycle. Um, the water cycle basically ex explains how on earth the water is constantly cycled around and reused. So there's some important key words. First of all, evaporation. So this could be water evaporating from the sea, for example. That water would evaporate and when it gets higher up in the atmosphere, it would cool down and it would condense into clouds. So we've got first evaporation and then condensation. As those clouds move around, at some point they will then um, turn into rainfall and this is called precipitation and that rain will fall back down onto the earth. At this point it might flow for example into rivers straight back into the sea um, or it might get taken up by plants and when plants take up water they can that water can then be evaporated from their leaves. So this comes up um, in topic in paper one as well this process whereby plants take up water and evaporate it from a, from their leaves and this is called transpiration so in this process here through evaporation condensation precipitation flow back into the rivers and transpiration that is how the water is cycled on our planet so a lot of key words there you might see for example the idea that if you have some water in an iceberg for example on the sea they might ask you to suggest how that water ends up in a lake so here you would have the water 
the iceberg melting into the sea, that water evaporating, condensing into clouds, and then you would have the precipitation um, that would lead to the rainfall filling up the lake. Further to the water cycle, you also need to know how carbon is cycled. So carbon is a compound that you're probably well aware is in the gas carbon dioxide. So a carbon dioxide is um, has a major involvement in moving this carbon around the atmosphere, but it doesn't always have to involve carbon dioxide. Let's start over here first of all. Photosynthesis is part of the carbon cycle because plants take in carbon dioxide and then they um, add that to water that they take up through their roots and they make a substance called glucose and oxygen and that you'll see balanced out with sixes in front of the oxygen, the water and the carbon dioxide. So this process it takes the carbon from the gas here and turns it into, um, cycles it so that it then goes into this molecule here which is glucose. Plants will then, sorry, animals will then eat the plants and therefore they will consume the carbon here from this glucose molecule and that will be taken in by the animal. Animals will then both respire and produce waste so some of the, the carbon will be in the waste here but it also be released by the animal as CO2 when the animal respires. Plants also respire so the respiration from animals and plants will again release CO2 back into the atmosphere. When the animal and the plants die they will the carbon that is in these organisms will be recycled through the process of decay. Microorganisms are mainly responsible for de decay. So the microorganisms will feed on the um, dead plants and animals and they will also respire. It's not just the larger animals and plants that you think of as respiring but also these microorganisms are respiring and therefore they are also releasing CO2 back into the atmosphere. Vehicle emissions are also responsible for releasing carbon dioxide. So the carbon starts off first of all locked up in fossil fuels as the hydrocarbons and then when they are burned through a combustion reaction that is um, as we looked at in the chemistry topic combustion um, results in carbon dioxide and water being released and that is another way that carbon dioxide or carbon is cycled and finally factory emissions so they are burning fossil fuels also releasing CO2 into the atmosphere and this completes the carbon cycle. The process of decay is whereby microorganisms such as um, bacteria or fungi or they could just be really small um, microscopic creatures are feeding upon um, organic waste and organic matter for example plants and animals that have died and by doing that they recycle the waste and it can be used for things such as compost. There are very particular conditions that are needed for decay for these microorganisms to respire. So normally decay will happen in aerobic conditions so things such as worms are really good for creating channels in the soil for air to get in to allow um, oxygen in and decay to happen. So normally it happens in aerobic con conditions and these microorganisms break down the uh, orga organic material and they when doing so need to be able to respire. So the main things that affect decay are temperature, we need a warm environment for um, decay to happen so a warm environment needs to be. Water is also important if you have a moist environment that promotes decay as well. The availability of the oxygen due, due to the need of the uh, microorganisms to respire. 
So aerated soils are really good for a fast rate of decay and also the number of decaying organ organisms that you have on there. So literally the number of microorganisms that you have to decay the um, organic matter. So questions they might ask about this might be linked to compost bins, for example. So within compost, you've got organic waste that is decaying. So sometimes they are black to absorb the sunlight to keep them warm. You'll see them have holes in them to allow the oxygen and the air to get into uh, the compost bins. They will often have somewhere for the water to get in as well. Not so it's completely waterlogged, but there may be a... Uh, a lid with a few holes in so some moisture can get in for the decaying process. One commercial use of decay comes um, in by the means of anaerobic decay. So normally decay, like we said, happens with oxygen and it will be aerobic. But one commercial use of decay is anaerobic decay because it produces a product called methane gas because of the anaerobic respiration that the microorganisms are carrying out. So anaerobic decay will mean without oxygen and we're trying to use this commercially to produce methane gas which is useful as a fuel. So what we would do is we'd have a chamber um, where we would put into that our organic waste material. So here we have an inlet for our waste material. So it could be animal waste or plant waste that we're putting in here. And out of that becomes our digested material. So in here we would have our waste material and our microorganisms in there decaying it in anaerobic conditions. And we have a pipe here which we would remove the, all the digested material. And this can be used as a fertiliser and put back onto the soils for example. And then also you will have a pipe coming out of the top as well for methane gas which is produced during the anaerobic respiration and the anaerobic conditions that are occurring inside the generator. And these generators are called biogas generators. So we get the gas from the word methane gas that we're being produced and bio is because we were making it from a material that was biological, so biogas generator.